what we'd like to do now is uh, invite Michael from Carino. Michael, are you there? I am here. Let me uh, share my screen. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Roberts, and I'm the CEO of uh, Carino Therapeutics. And I want to echo what uh, uh, the prior uh, presenters uh, said about uh, you know thanking Muriel for putting on such a wonderful program and continuing to do it in light of where we are uh, with COVID. And you know I really do want to thank you for attending. Uh, you know, taking time out of your Saturday afternoon to listen to some of the you know wonderful presentations and more, because when you do that, it makes us better. And in, in turn, it's a snowball effect. And, and, and again, we can, we can help each other. So we, I wanna thank you for that. So um, a little bit about Carino. Carino's a, a, again, a, a very small company. If we talk about Pfizer, then Eidos, and then Carino, it's, it's a, a much different um, than even Eidos. So we're a small company, but we are solely focused on the treatment of ATTR and developing uh, the program um, CX, CRX1008. And I'll tell you a little bit about that and what the mechanism is like. So just a disclaimer, uh, this is an investigational medicine. It's not approved uh, for the treatment of ATTR, uh, but we're working on hopefully getting there. So as many of the uh, you know, kinetic stabilizing presentations have outlined and even the pr prior ones, you know, there's a pathology of this disease where you have a tetrameric protein that dissociates, unfolds, and then forms these amyloid fibrils. So we are one step in that process. Um, we are a, a classified as a kinetic stabilizer, which binds to two unique uh, binding sites on the TTR protein. Um, and you know, to get optimal stabilization, you need to bind to both T4 bindings, binding pockets. The one interesting thing about the compound we're developing, which is a product that's currently available for Parkinson's disease, is called tocopone. It binds with extremely low negative binding cooperativity, which means that at very low concentrations, it can bind to both sites, thereby optimally stabilizing the protein. So that's one mechanism which we'll briefly go in today. The other one I want to mention is this, uh, we have data now, which I'll present to you, where we can actually disrupt fibrils that are already formed, thereby potentially clearing which uh, material that's already in various tissues. So I think that's something I, and again, it's very preliminary, but I do want to say, you know, this is a sort of present presentation of what the mechanisms of our drug are. And of course, we do think that there's other activities of the drug that can lend some additional benefit to treating uh, various symptoms within ATTR. So just like uh, the analogy of the four leaf clover, which I think this is sort of a, an interesting uh, lead into, we treat this as a puzzle, right? So we're bringing puzzle pieces together and we'll show four puzzle pieces here. One being kinetic stabilization, right? So again, tocopone being classified as a potent kinetic stabilizer. We'll kind of show you a little bit of information about that. The other part of the piece of the puzzle is the fibril disruption activity. And we'll show information about that. We also think another piece to this is that you have the ability to distribute throughout the body to, to optimally and hopefully max, in maximal amounts stabilize it throughout the body, meaning that it distributes even through the blood-brain barrier into the CNS where uh, there can be um, you know, accumulation of TTR uh, antibodies. And then the other thing is, you know, are there other biological activities that can enhance the therapeutic benefit? And again, we'll briefly describe that. So at, at the end of the day, we're trying to bring all these four pieces together in a puzzle to say that, can we enhance the therapeutic benefit of a drug by, by these means? So let's go into a little bit about the kinetic stability. Again, this is just a general representation of the TTR protein. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, four units, each being uh, each of the four monomer units coming together to form the tetramer. Each has a distinct structure. So in this case, the lines are this tertiary structure, which is defined 
in this uh, each individual monomer. And again, those can change back and forth, right? So there's a dynamic between these tetramers. So they may come apart and they may come back together. So there's a, there's a kinetic dynamic uh, with that. But some cases they fall apart into each of the monomers. And then at the right hand side, you see, you know, like it was described where you can crumple up a piece of paper, that structure unfolds and therefore you can't bring those tetramers back together. And that's what forms the amyloid, okay? So obviously kinetic stabilization, binding as a kinetic stabilizer to the two T4 binding pockets, we can stabilize that tetramer form, thereby preventing the dissociation and then the, you know, preventing the amyloid fibrils. So this is the concept of a kinetic stabilizer, but there's a different stability also in TTR. And that's what we call thermodynamic stability. So in most cases, you know, you'll have this tetramer and the rate limiting step of amyloid formation is the dissociation, the kinetic stability. But there, this thermodynamic stability is this unfolding, going from this tetramer to an unfolded monomer. Okay, and there are things in the body, different interactions with proteins and other small molecules and things like that, that can actually disrupt the tertiary structure and assist in the dissociation and the unfolding of this protein, thereby enhancing the amyloid genicity of these uh, proteins. And even by binding to the T4 binding pocket as a kinetic stabilizer, doesn't always prevent the total dissociation because these, uh, the, these, things, these things that occur in the body can misfold the protein, thereby enhancing the kinetic instability and forming these fibrils. So there's a, a relationship between kinetic stability and thermodynamic stability. Can, can we enhance or um, you know, improve both so that uh, we can get better uh, TTR, um, lack of TTR amyloid formation. So this was a publication back uh, some time ago by Yoshiki Sekijima in Japan, um, who worked under Do Dr. Kelly at Scripps. And they did um, sort of a, a, an analysis of, you know, 30 different variants where they determined what the kinetic stability and the thermodynamic stability are, okay? Um, and on the right-hand side, you'll see various points, and each one of these are each of the uh, different mutations that are in TTR. On the y-axis, you'll, you'll see kinetic stability. So this is the, the rate at which the tetramer dissociates into these individual monomers. On the x-axis, so along the horizon here, is the thermodynamic stability. This is the unfolding going from this tetramer to the unfolding of the monomer at a, a concentration of a, dis, a denaturation agent. And you can see they, they plot these individual mutations on a plot which correlate between kinetic and thermodynamic stability. And so there's a couple of different points I wanna uh, you know, mention on here. Obviously you see the wild type. This is kind of the standard, this is the baseline for the, the stability, if you will, of, of TTR. But there's you know, other mutations, there's the V30M, Again, similar kinetic stability, maybe even slightly more kinetically stable, but significantly less thermodynamically stable, okay? Then we have the V122i, again, producing a lot of the cardiomyopathy um, in, 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 some of the, in some patients, obviously. And that has a, a near equivalent thermodynamic stability, but a different kinetic stability. And again, we can go through all these, the Y114C, obviously having mainly a peripheral neuropathy, but can also produce, uh, you know, ocular manifestations, CNS. That's why it's uh, colored uh, green here. And then we have some very kinetically unstable mutations, which are D18G and A25T. Again, these dissociate into the individual monitors very quickly, okay? Then we have, um, Things like the, the Y69H. Again, this is actually much more kinetically stable than wild type protein. So it doesn't dissociate into its 
individual monomers intact, they actually, if you look at this protein wrong, it seems like it will unfold, right? Enhancing the kinetic instability. So it's very, very thermodynamically unstable. So again, all of these um, have, have differences and a single mutation can affect the stability in different ways. And of course, then we have the T119N mutation, which is a thermodynamically uh, and kinetically more stable than wild type, thereby enhancing the overall stability and the lack of TTR amyloid. Uh, okay. So can we alter these other interactions that enhance, that you know, go from the top right to the bottom left, which is the most unstable? we modify or can we do something where we can push and drive the mutation uh, to a more thermodynamically and kinetically stable um, you know, protein? And so we think we can, we can potentially do that. So the other parts of this puzzle we're putting together is biodistribution. As I mentioned, uh, we're developing tocopon, which is a drug for uh, Parkinson's, and it's very well known to cross the blood-brain barrier. We uh, published a, a study at the recent ISA meeting with Dr. Burke, uh, where we demonstrate that we can potently stabilize TTR uh, in the CSF uh, of uh, leptomeningeal patients. So we think this is an opportunity um, to help patients that maybe have CNS manifestations or will have them in the future. Um, and this compound is also unique in that it's a COMT inhibitor, its use in Parkinson's disease, which enhances the uh, norepinephrine and uh, dopamine levels, which can enhance, you know, working memory, cognition, things like that, which become a problem in various CNS manifestations of this particular um, uh, disease. So, so we think we might have some benefits there. And again, we think we also have uh, ways to push the thermodynamic and, and kinetic stability to the upper right corner of that uh, prior plot. And then again, the fiber disruption activity, which I do want to mentioned today. So there's the fibril disruption activity, obviously going from an, an fibril to something that can be uh, readily cleared. You know, there are small molecules. Uh, these are polyphenolic compounds, which like our EGCG, curcumin, NDGA. And you may know that uh, doxycycline is in clinical trials as a fibril disruptor. Um, again, what these do is these disrupt those fibrils and then you can potentially clear them from various tissues thereby hopefully enhancing uh, the, the symptom uh, and the uh, pathology of the disease. So what we have here is on the top, we have both microscopes. So you can see the, what the fibrils look like. And then you can, on the right-hand side, which is what's called uh, uh, light scattering, which measures the size of these individual fibrils or particles. And it goes from low, small size to you know, large, which are the fibrils uh, that are formed. So in the control group where you have no drug present, you can see on the very far right, you have a distribution of large, middle, and small size particles. When you add EGCG, you see a shift to the smaller particle size. Therefore, you're disrupting that fibril that's already established, producing the smaller you know, monomeric or you know, di dimers or trimers that can be you know, potentially cleared. And again, you can see the same thing with the other drugs that you can shift the larger fibrils to the smaller species, thereby potentially clearing the fibril. So we, we, we potentially see this with our drug. Um, Dr. Sareva from Portugal did some work uh, you know, several years ago, which demonstrated that uh, uh, nitrophenols, which is a similar structure to what's in circled at the bottom left, they can have shown that you can disrupt these fibrils completely uh, with this particular uh, you know, chemistry. And again, the chemistry is of, our, of, of the drug is such that you know, we have the potential now to show fibril disruption. And again, we have shown that. So in the control group, where we have large aggregates and, salt and, and a distribution of small aggregates, we can shift that with a short sort of incubation we can shift that to a smaller uh, particle size. Therefore, we, we can remove the, potentially the fibrils that are already formed. So we think this is, you know, has some potential benefit when we um, 
talk about you know, what's the clinical effect at the end of the day. So what we're doing here is we're trying to pull these different pieces together and, and get a, a molecule and have a molecule where we can enhance the therapeutic effect by having you know, activity in each one of these areas. And we think we, we can do that. So, um, you, know, um, you know, I do want to thank you again for, for, for listening. And, you know, obviously in the Q&A session, be happy to answer any questions you have and look forward to hopefully meeting you guys uh, in, a, in a, uh, you know, a meeting, uh, hopefully in 2021. Thank you, Michael. Everyone's Googling thermodynamics right now. So, you know, and Here you go. We, <laughs> but, and, and we will have a Q&A, but uh, for everyone, and we've got more presentations.